Several years back, I was talking to a therapist who worked in the, what you might call the drug district of Vancouver, a large section of the downtown area. It's been taken over by people who are drug addicts. And one of the services the government wanted to provide for them was psychotherapy, free psychotherapy. You could just walk in, talk to a therapist. And he said he found that no one wanted to come until he started teaching them how to practice acceptance of themselves, not be so hard on themselves. More people would come, but the problem was that they became even more heavily involved in drugs as a result. And as he was talking to me, he says, maybe it's not working out. I said, of course it's not working out. You don't, want to, you don't want people to accept the, their status as doing something unskillful and just stay there. The Buddha's model for therapy was something very different. He saw himself as, as a teacher who had to provide protection. And his mode of pro protection was to teach you that there are grounds for deciding what should and should not be done. Because after all, your actions are what shape your life. And it would be very unkind for him to just let you do whatever in ignorance, not knowing what the results would be. He wanted to make it very clear that certain actions lead to really undesirable results. We know that there are some of his teachings that are very heavily dependent on context, that you use them in some circumstances and not in others. But there are some that are what he called categorical, where well, it's true across the board for everybody. And those were not meant to be bent to make people comfortable. If you find them challenging, well, it's a good challenge. Because ultimately, the Buddha's compassion is to help you help yourself, and to stretch you when you need to be stretched. So we're not here just to be comfortable. You can see that in the most basic of the two categorical teachings, which are the ten forms of skillful and unskillful behavior. In terms of bodily action, no killing, no stealing, no illicit sex. In terms of verbal action, no lying, no divisive tail-bearing, no harsh speech, no idle chatter. In terms of the mind, no inordinate greed, in other words, greed that goes beyond the bounds of the precepts, no ill will and trying to develop right view, holding firmly to the principle that your actions really do matter. They are real, and you're responsible for them, and they're going to have consequences based on the state of mind with which you do them. So you avoid wrong view, develop right view, and you avoid all those wrong forms of action. And this, the Buddha said, is true across the board. You don't have to test these principles for yourself. You can take them as your guide. And then from there you may find that you have to develop your own powers of observation in terms of what you do and the results that you're going to get. But there are certain principles that are absolutes. That's what categorical means, basically. You just don't kill, period. You don't have. You don't steal, period. No illicit sex, period. Why? As the Buddha said, if you could do these things and they would lead to happiness in the long term, there would be no reason for him to say not to do them, but because they lead to long-term suffering, you want to avoid them. So he's not setting out rules just for the sake of setting out rules. It's there for your protection. And then he teaches you further how to train the mind. Again, we're here practicing meditation, not just to find a nice comfort zone, 
but for our protection. Because we need to be able to watch our minds. Because one of the basic principles of karma, as I said, is that when you do an action based on an unskillful mind state, it's going to have unfortunate consequences. The problem is we're not really clear about our mind states. Greed can sometimes sneak in and we're hardly aware of it. Anger sneaks in. Delusion is the worst. Because when you're deluded, you don't know you're deluded. And so we have to train the mind to be on guard against these things. As the Buddha said, the basis for all are skillful actions. Not that we're in innately good, it's from heedfulness, realizing that there are dangers. We have this power through our ability to choose what we're going to do and say and think. We should have a strong sense that we could misuse that power. We want to learn how not to. Again, protecting ourselves basically from ourselves. So we develop mindfulness, we develop concentration. And an important part of both the mindfulness and the concentration are that you be alert. And their mind should be questioning things, particularly in the practice of concentration. This is what's called directed thought and evaluation. So you should be questioning yourself as I focus on the breath. What helps me to settle down in a way where I'm both calm and alert? The Buddha makes a distinction between calm and concentration. Calm is just a sense of stillness. Concentration is a firm, firmly intent mind. And that's created by the fact that you're asking questions. You're taking a curious attitude to what's going on in your mind. If you come just for the calm, it's very easy to zone out. It's a type of concentration called delusion concentration, where you're very still, but there's no alertness, very little mindfulness. It comes from the mind's beginning to settle down, and there's a sense of pleasure that comes with the breath. And you just decide to drop the breath and you go straight for the pleasure, wallow in the pleasure. And things begin to blur out, the kind of a nice, pleasant haze. But there's no alertness, there's no way any kind of insight is going to arise. And it lacks the firmness of concentration, a really concentrated mind. And the Thai translation for the word samadhi, or concentration, is a mind that's firmly intent. So you want to be firmly intent on what you're doing. So as things get comfortable, you want to practice what the Buddha calls developing the body, which means having a sense of pleasure in the body, but not letting it invade the mind and remain. You stay with the breath. The pleasure is there. You appreciate the pleasure. In fact, the Buddha says you indulge in it, you settle in. But you also have to realize that the pleasure comes from causes. And if you want to maintain the pleasure, you've got to keep the causes up, which are mindfulness, alertness, ardency. The qualities that give power and clarity to your concentration. And of course, the, the insights that can come from concentration. If you take a curious attitude, as we were saying this afternoon, if you find yourself getting sleepy or drowsy, one of the reasons may be boredom. So start asking questions about what's going on. What are the physical symptoms of sleepiness and drowsiness? And do you have to focus on them? Are there any signs in the body that the body could still be awake, the mind could still be awake? Focus on those instead, because the present moment it's not a given. There are potentials that come from the past, but we make our actual experience of the present moment out of them through our intentions. So where are your intentions right now? 
If you're stuck on simply wanting to rest, you will zone out. So you want to be curious about what's going on in the mind. How does the mind keep fooling itself like this? How does it make you sleepy? And then when you get up from the meditation, the sleepiness is gone. What's going on there? Who's fooling whom here in the mind? When you start asking questions like this, that's the kind of concentration that can lead to insight. And what are the insights about? The Four Noble Truths. Here again, you don't want to simply accept the fact that there is stress or accept the fact that there is craving. You want to figure out where exactly is the stress right now. In other words, what am I clinging to right now? And where is the craving focused right now? What can I do to develop the factors of the path instead of following my cravings? In other words, direct your desire away from the desire for sensuality or becoming, non-becoming. Focus it more on trying to develop skillful qualities in the mind, abandon unskillful ones. There is desire in the path. A path without desire wouldn't go anywhere. So you do have to have some desire. Just learn how to recognize what's skillful and what's unskillful. This is part of your protection. And the Buddha is basically saying, we're not here just to accept ourselves as we are. Accept the fact that we're acting in unskillful ways and create suffering, but we don't have to. We can change our ways. Keeping that possibility open is part of the protection that he offers to us. So take advantage of the fact that he has given us protection. He's protecting us from our bewilderment. As he said, the basic response to suffering is one, bewilderment, and two, a search. Is there somebody who knows a way to put an end to the suffering? All too often our bewilderment colors our search. So we go to the wrong people, take the wrong teachings. But he's offering reliable guidance so we can end our bewilderment and protect ourselves from using this power we have to shape our experience in the wrong way. By showing us very clearly that there is a right way. He sets out these ideals. This is how you practice meditation. This is what a good state of concentration is like. He's, he describes these things very carefully as things to aspire to. Not to make us feel bad about ourselves, but just to keep reminding ourselves that you have to be heedful. Now the whole point of heedfulness is that there are dangers, but there are ways of avoiding the dangers. So he sets them out basic principles that you can rely on, and then principles for training yourself to be a better and better observer of what's going on in your mind. Then you become a more observant judge of your own mind states, learning to distance yourself from them so that you're not constantly thinking, well, because it's in my mind, it must be good and I'm going to go with it. That's dangerous. You've lost your protection. Your protection is your ability to stand back and say, this thought that I'm thinking, is it really in my best interest? When you see that it's not, then no matter how much you may like it, you're willing to let go. So we're not here just for comfort. You could compare the Buddha to a, a cook. The cooks who try to please you just give you sweets which may or may not be good for you. A really good cook sees that you have the potential to become a cook as well. And so it teaches you this is how you fix your food so it doesn't make you sick. And it actually is good for your health. That's the sign of a, what you may call a therapist who really is concerned about your well-being, someone who really is compassionate. 
He's not trying to make you feel good right now. He's trying to give you long-term welfare and happiness, beyond long-term. He says there's a way to master your actions so they actually take you to the edge of the deathless. That's when you have your ultimate protection. That's when you're really safe. That's why it's called Kema, ultimate safety. So you're trying to take advantage of what the Buddha is offering you. Not just a pleasant time here, drifting off, but guidance on how to get control of your own mind so that it no longer poses any dangers for you and can find a safe date that you really can rely on. <laughs>